Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Why I'm So Standing. I'm Marie Barclay, and I'm thrilled to introduce to you joyful and brave Claire Riley, uh, sharing a different spin on the motions of grief after being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which is also called MS, in April 2017. So Claire is a mum to a seven-year-old Elliot and wife also to Jay. And for those not aware of MS, it is a debilitating disease in which the immune system eats away at the protective covering of your nerves, disrupting the communication lines between the brain and body with varying symptoms of pain, fatigue and impaired coordination. Claire amplifies how her life has changed from the diagnosis of MS and basically from the get-go, refusing to let MS define her as an individual. We speak about this a bit more in the podcast, but the name didn't come to me at the time. So in David Kessler's book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief, he mentions love and grief are inextricably intertwined. And he also mentioned healing doesn't mean the loss didn't happen. It means that it no longer controls us. And the latter sums up how Claire is living her life now with more meaning. Her effervescent nature and resilience allow her to do the normal, day-to-day simple things in life, incorporating her physical limitations. For Claire to better understand herself with MS and in teaching others how to love who they are with or without a chronic illness, she launched the mindful podcast named MS Understood in October 2020. Here, Claire highlights stories of those living with MS and more recently practitioners to those with MS, allowing continuous education of this chronic disease to reach a wider demographic of listeners. I know that you're absolutely going to love this and I really, really enjoyed having a chat with Claire and I know that you will as well. So enjoy. So welcome, Claire. Welcome to our Why I'm Still Standing platform. It's it's such an honor to have you here. Um, Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yes. And I really look forward to our listeners finding out more about the grief that you've experienced after being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Yeah, it's Uh, been a big few years. Yes, it has been. So you're from the suburb of Port Arlington in Victoria. Yep. And um, you have one child and you're married. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that. But I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation with you, Claire. And um, I'm happy for you to sort of share, you know, when it was that you did get the diagnosis and and what has sort of played out from that moment. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to chime in with some questions here and there that I have prepared for you. So, yes, the stage is all yours, Claire. (laughs) It is quite a... There's a few elements, I suppose, to my diagnosis story. Um, in about November 2016, I started getting a really sore back. Mm. Um, and that was, I suppose, what ultimately led to my diagnosis. I had this back. I, I went to visit a few different practitioners. And it, finally, I went to a GP and he sent me to a neurologist. About the same time, my husband and I had applied for a job to work at a not-for-profit off-the-grid outdoor education center Mm. in Gippsland, Victoria. Mm. So about five hours drive from where we are. East Bansdale, I remember you saying. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of up that way. Mm. Um, And so I went to a neurologist for the first time. And in that appointment, I was told I either had a benign brain tumor or multiple sclerosis and I needed an MRI to get a definitive diagnosis. Mm. And then I waited six weeks to get a result. So that time was really difficult. Mm. During that time, that six, we actually got the six weeks, uh, we got offered the position. So, oh no, we applied for the job. So sorry, the first appointment, we applied for this job. Um, It was my dream job. I'd I'd been to this camp as a child, um, as a 16 year old. I'd worked there at 18. Um, My husband and I had been to visit over the last, um, we started going up there in June, 2016. Mm. So this was our dream job, our dream kind of move as a family. Mm. So we applied for the job, I got my diagnosis, and then we got offered the position. Mm. So it was quite a tricky and kind of tumultuous time because I had got my dream job. Like, Mm. I don't have time for a diagnosis. I don't have time to deal with that. I don't, you know, everything seems fine. I've just got a sore back. It's totally fine. I'll just ignore it. 
you know, as we know, we talk about grief um, Mm -hmm. and we do talk about those five stages. From what I have experienced and from the people I've spoken to, those five stages are a guide um, more than a... Yeah, what is definitely going to... Yeah, Yeah, it's definitely definitely much looser than that and Mm. things come and go, but I was definitely in denial. So I, we went... Or about a month after my diagnosis, we moved to the camp. So we we rented out our home. Mm. Um, we moved all our stuff into storage. We drove, you know, we packed up all our stuff and our, and our two and a bit year old at the time, and and moved to Gippsland. And I work, we worked there. It's a very physically demanding job. Mm. Um, so we were there for two and a half years, and we moved home back to Port Arlington in October 2019. So we finished yeah. out our contract. Um, it was a two to three year contract and we wanted to move home in time for our son to start school in 2020. Mm, yes. which, you know, we all know how that went. But during that time, I noticed my symptoms declining. Like I said, I was fairly well ignoring my diagnosis. I didn't really talk about it. I didn't really acknowledge it. Yeah. And I suppose too, the excitement of having your dream job, that sort of Mm, totally took over, right? Yeah, yeah, as it should, right? You know, we can't live our lives like with our heads in a diagnosis. Uh, That's not who I am. Yeah. And what if it was a misdiagnosis? I mean, not that it was, but yeah. Yeah. So you really can't live live your life like that so I'm really yeah proud of you but you I remember you saying that you did pretty much ignore it right during mm. those two and a half years yeah and you didn't really return to it until 12 months after you returned back mm. to you know your son starting school and um, yeah yeah and all of that so I did notice that my symptoms so um MS is quite impacted by the heat and stress mm. so in the summer of 2018 2019 it was really hot at the camp, you know, we're going through some pretty stressful times at the camp. And I really noticed that my walking was declining. So I hadn't Mm. told anyone. I hadn't Mm. publicly, like obviously my family knew. I hadn't told my employers. I hadn't, I told our staff because hiking was something that I wasn't able to do at the time. But also like I was a mum of a two and a half year old. I was running a camp. Like I wasn't going hiking. That's not what I was there to do. Mm. Um, But I did really notice that my symptoms were declining. And at that stage, I told our employers and they were great, super supportive, you know, Mm. she told us um, all that kind of stuff. But from that point, I really did notice a decline for kind of the last nine months that we were there of really getting hit by fatigue. Yeah, physical um, limitations. Physical, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And and I blamed the camp for that. I was like, this is a super kind of stressful job. Like we're in, in charge of, we lived and worked with six staff over the mm. three years. We had groups of 24 or students and teachers coming in every week. Mm. Um, we had driving them places. They were out on hikes. Like we were kind of on call. 24-7 and we work six days a week. Yeah, that's massive, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, so you can understand that I blamed the job for my mm. fatigue, for my body being sore and tired. Um, then when we did move home in October and, you know, my husband was really tired and he started to get less tired as we started to kind of integrate back into normal world life. Mm-hmm. I well, normal as we know it. <laughs> well, well, it was still normal at the time. Um so I didn't get less tired. I kept staying tired and my walking wasn't getting easier. And, and that's when I really hit that kind of grief of, oh, sh- I don't know if I'm yeah. allowed to swear. Oh, but- please do. Uh, Just be natural, yeah, Claire. So. Completely, oh, shit, this is not going anywhere. Yeah. Like I'd said, I'd been ignoring it. I'd been blaming the camp. I'd have been ignoring it for two and a half years. And at this stage, I was really angry. Mm. You know, just like, it's not fair. Yeah. Why me? Yeah. You know, my my background's outdoor education. I have a degree in outdoor education and I can't hike anymore. Mm. Like, it's not fair. You know, all of these things of like, you know, yeah. that the, anger. The, 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 the victim degree. sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so at that stage, I had a full meltdown. My husband was in Nepal for work. So he was gone for, this was the December. So we'd been home for about six weeks and he went away for a month. Mm. And my parents lived around the corner and I um, just full meltdown. I can't do this. I hate it. It's not fair. And I generally try and be a fairly kind of positive person. Positive all the time. And I also spend, I suppose, a lot of, not a lot of energy, but I do try and protect my family members from maybe what I'm really going through. your feelings, yeah. 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 And and that's not expected of me, absolutely Mm. not. It's definitely something that I'm like, well, I'll just deal with it and it's not going away, so 
it's kind of no point burdening these people, you know, that feeling of being a burden, mm. these people around me. But this was just a full meltdown. And, yeah. you know, we kind of all put our heads together and thought, what can we do? So at that stage, I applied for the NDIS, which I'm super grateful that we have access to mm. that kind of support. Mm. Um, and I started seeing a physiotherapist. I got declined from the NDIS. Um, I wasn't disabled enough at the time, mm, apparently. Goodness. Uh, but I applied very quickly after that. Yeah. And, and you just need a lot of evidence. I actually have a podcast episode on my podcast chatting with someone who used to work for the NDIS about yeah. how to navigate uh, navigate the bureaucratic. System. Yeah, yes, yeah. Right? And it's yep. all about having hints of evidence. So I applied again and got funding. And I swear, like, my walking's difficult now and I'm in a lot of pain a lot of the time. But if I didn't have access to that funds, I wouldn't be walking mm. now. And I would be much worse mentally yeah. and emotionally than I am because I've, you know, I've got access to a therapist, a physiotherapist, mm. um, all of those things. And I think that was a good kind of move for me to be able to support myself or be able to get support financially. We don't earn a lot of money. We're happy with that. Mm. Um, mm. But my NDIS package is more than our yearly income. And mm. that's what, you know, how much it costs to yeah. look after yourself with a disability and that's insane yes but I'm glad that you got through the loophole right Mm. and and that you went back after being told that you had been declined Mm. you still you know fought for for yourself because yeah um, yeah yeah how different would your life be right now if you didn't have access to that but also think about how many thousands of people out there who have had the same you know Mm. may have had um, a similar experience to you of getting declined and then just not going any further yeah yeah absolutely Mm. yeah so I think like you said before it took me so we moved home in October 2019 Mm -hmm. obviously we went into lockdown March 2020 and we did prep by remote learning and all that stuff and Mm. I was able to maintain seeing my physiotherapist throughout all of the lockdowns which I'm super grateful for Mm. and I was at the gym one day and and when I'd been first diagnosed you know as I've said I was in grief and I didn't really want to talk to anyone else Mm. about it but I wanted to hear stories of people that I would relate to with MS so a lot of the advertising around MS a lot of the fundraising Mm. you often see people in wheelchairs which is obviously a common symptom of living with MS is being unable to walk and being in a wheelchair but it's not the only story Yeah. Um, you know, I had MS and I was running an outdoor education camp. I wanted to hear stories of people who were active, who were living their lives. Yeah, um, as, as normally as possible, right? We, we, yeah, yeah, the... yeah. And I couldn't find at the time. I wanted a podcast. I wanted to be able to, you know, put my headphones in, do the veggie gardening or do my work or whatever and kind of do it in private, like mm. grieve and hear those stories in private. And I couldn't find it. Mm. There's quite a few podcasts out there now and there and there was at the time. I just couldn't yeah, find it. Yeah. And so, yeah, about the October 2020, I had this kind Tiffany. of like, yeah, <laughs> and I, it's like this light bulb moment of mm. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do that podcast. I'm yeah. going to start that podcast. And I think, sorry, it was probably August. Mm. I ended up starting it, releasing the first episode in October, 2020. And that's when I think my life and my mindset around having MS really changed is yeah. after being able to chat. And yes. Stories. Yeah. So the name of your podcast is MS Understood. Mm-hmm. Um, so congratulations on that. Thanks. And and it is like everything, right? It's It's about having the seed in your head, but then it's planting that seed and physically taking action to start it. And Mm. like you and and like myself, right, Claire, we had no idea Mm. how to even start a podcast, but here we are. And and you have done how many episodes from the first one that you launched on the 1st of October, 2020? Yeah. So I've released 70. Yes. So I do an episode every Monday morning. Yeah. Um, And for the first 12 months I interviewed was probably 50. So the first episode was my story Mm. and then the 52nd episode was like another one of you like an update type of thing yeah yeah so so I did 50 interviews in between those with people who live with MS and it was like the people I mean people are amazing yes I think in general but Mm. being able to chat with people um with multiple sclerosis who live with multiple sclerosis from all over the world like the stories that I hear or that I heard in that particular that first year of you know lawyers Mm. authors Mm. people who had hiked the Great Wall of China in high Mm. heels what yeah I know comedians 
I uh, chatted with a woman who was on a Netflix TV show called Win the Wilderness. Mm -hmm. She's from England. I chatted with Tim Ferguson, the comedian. I've chatted like, I mean, I'm super humbled every time someone says yes to saying yes. I know. I want to episode. I am too. I was blown away when you said, when when I received your email saying that you would love to be on this. Yeah. And and the story is like, you know, the reason I'm now seeing an exercise physiologist every week is because someone I interviewed said that they saw an exercise Mm. physiologist multiple times a week. And I was like, right, let's add that to my team. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and I was able to kind of hear all of those stories about how people look after their life. Mm. And the second year I decided that I'd personally heard for me enough of those kind of stories to get what I needed out of it Mm. but I knew that people still needed that so what I started doing is interviewing professionals or people who support those people yes I remember you saying you've interviewed recently a sex therapist right Mm. Um, yeah yeah Yeah. I'm sure we'll be in a standing listen. Mm, yeah, um, so Chantelle Otten is the be a sex therapy practice in Australia. Yeah. Mm. And she's, yeah, incredibly gracious with her time. She's just written a great book called The Sex Ed You Never Had. Okay. Um, yep. sure. And I just think it's a really, I mean, I'm going to give it to my son when he's Yes, I was going older. to say it's fantastic for, for yeah. children of all ages, I'm mm, sure. Yeah. Mm. I've got an episode actually coming out on Monday so it'll probably be out I'm not sure when this will come out but with my son so he's seven like I said and and we chat about what it's like to have a mum with MS so he oh um, how delightful yeah I'm really excited yeah I'm really looking forward to that and I and I I remember you said that when I asked you the the question what inspires you you said your son firstly your family and your community which is Mm. all wonderful so I do I would like you to speak more about what actually inspires you of those three, um, yep. of your son, of your family and of your community. But I wanted to say to you, Claire, that I've learned from you to keep my podcast consistent because mm. every Monday, consistently, every single week, you yep. launch a new podcast. In terms of my other works that I do, I couldn't possibly do it every week, right? Mm. Knowing the amount of work that needs to go into it. So, but I've actually committed to doing every fortnight right Mm -hmm. or every three weeks so uh, which I have been doing since the beginning of the year uh, which I'm very very grateful for so but thank you I just wanted to mention that I just think yeah it takes dedication and it takes discipline to be able to do that so Mm. so thank you yeah and I think it's one thing that I I suppose I committed to mentally before I'd started is that Mm. I wanted to release. So I release an episode every Monday morning Mm. at 5am and I schedule those. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And it was something I'd heard from someone is that, you know, it's that expectation around how people can expect or when people can expect Mm. coming out. It's also for me, because if I don't have some kind of commitment like that, if I'm like, I'll just release it, I won't. So if I, you know, it's my personality type. If I'm just like, oh, I'll just do it whenever I feel like it. I don't have that same I'm like no I have to get an episode ready to go so yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah. right yeah. because I've, I've found that that's been a bit of my limitation as well after mm. my previous episode I said to uh, uh, Kathleen Gage that I would be launching it the Wednesday after but it wasn't until the Wednesday after that mm. you know because so many other things had yeah come yeah, up that right. I There's had to deal else. with right but yeah. but like you said if you're really really committed and you're dedicated to it you're you'll find ways of moving those other things that you thought were important yeah. around yeah. this the importance of getting that out at five. Yeah. And I think if you for Monday. me, yeah, if if I've made the commitment. So I'm two weeks scheduled, two yes. weeks at the moment. Yeah. And I've got about four or five interviews that I'm yet to schedule. Mm. Um I also study part time, so I need to fit yes. in around that. But to me it's like I know that I've got two weeks ahead, but if I have time today, I would edit one mm, so that then I become three weeks ahead. I'm so, sort of in that Yeah, it's that, it's well. that thing of like it just means that like if I, on a Friday afternoon I don't have a podcast episode scheduled. Yeah, you get into like editing. I'm like, well, then, I have to, yeah. yeah. Whereas if I didn't have that Monday time. Routine. Then I'd just be like, oh, I'll just. Yeah. Don't worry, it, it don't be... worry no one will care. But mm. it's not about like. You know, it's not about what you think it's it's about what your audience is expecting right? yeah 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 and mm. obviously people would be very understanding if I miss one yeah, I I've, released, I've released 70 episodes 
like yeah, okay, congratulations. Kind of wow. like if I did it, if I missed an episode now or missed a Monday now, I'd be like, oh, you know, like how's yeah. that streak? You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're letting yourself down, right? It's, yeah. it's you're doing yeah. a disservice to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After all the work that I've put yes, in, yes, exactly. And I love it how it was just a seed, and then now all of a sudden, mm. you've obviously inspired a lot of people, right? And so, what is it like a favorite affirmation, or what is it? Well, you probably have. I yeah, actually I have just showing. released yes. um, a deck, and I've got them right here, a deck yeah. of um, affirmation cards, yes. so um, it's a deck called Affirm, and it's chronic illness. It's daily inspiration for life with a chronic illness, mm-hmm. and actually the card I pulled today just simply says I am enough. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Which then, is perfect for this, right? Perfect yeah. for our, yeah, the yeah. heading of our podcast. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah, there's 55 and it's I just released them, I think, nearly two weeks ago. And yes. I'm starting to see them after the kind of that first couple of weeks of them being posted out and stuff. I'm just starting to see them pop up on other people's Instagram, Instagram accounts. Which is so great. Nice. Oh, how neat is that? Yeah. So, yeah. so what is the cost of those just for the, the listeners who are like to order? $28 yep. um, plus postage and you can find yeah. them on Etsy. Excellent. All right. Yeah. All right. But you'll provide a, a link. For uh, yeah, I would love to. So yeah. yeah, it's it's just my. Honor. I would love every one. Time, Yay! Every time <laughs> someone um, purchases one, it's just I, I do a little dance. It's very yeah. Fun, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's those yeah. little things that count, right? I get excited, right? Just with very mm. little things. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've got a little um, like love heart thing here. So anytime someone plays an order, I put a little heart on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. But yeah, so the cards are designed specifically for life with chronic illness. Mm. They would suit anyone, really. Uh, just kind of inspiration, you know. Like yeah. I'm enough doesn't have to be someone with a no. chronic illness. There yeah. are a few throughout the pack that, that, is the that, that are specific. So my illness does this or, um, mm. you know, the pain or, or that sort of thing. So anyone could buy them, but maybe they all the cards wouldn't be relevant. All righty. That's great. I love how you said as well that you were, uh, I mean, you have um, qualifications as an outdoor educator. Mm. How much fun is that, right? Is, yeah, that, is well, that the reason behind the impetus of becoming an outdoor educator because of all the fun that you would have? Um, well, it, it sounds, I think it sounds way more fun than it maybe is. I didn't do outdoor ed in school. I thought mm. it was a stupid idea, but I've always camped and hiked with my mm. family. We've always gone hiking. We've always gone camping and that sort of thing. And so when I went to the camp that we went and worked at as a 16-year-old, I went there as a school camp, Mm. just didn't think anything much of it. I fell in love with the place and the people who are connected with it. And then I went and worked there straight out of high school. So Mm. I spent a year there working. Yeah. Yeah, And it's a really quite a voluntary position. I think I made $3,000 the whole year that Mm. I was working there. But it's um, not to do with money when, when you have no. such a love and a passion yeah. for something, right? Yeah. And I'd applied to get into environmental management and ecology when I was in mm. year 12. And I got into my first preference and I burst into tears because I was not, I didn't know what Expected. I wanted to do. Yeah. I didn't, no, no, I didn't want it. Yeah. I didn't want to be in it. I, the idea of doing this, it wasn't right. I couldn't figure it out. Anyway. When I worked at this camp and someone said, to, I was like, I don't know what to do next. And someone said to me, why don't you go and do outdoor ed? You know, you're working here, go and do an mm. outdoor ed degree. And again, the people who are connected with outdoor ed are so great. It's actually mm. quite funny. I finished that degree in 2008 and mm. yesterday reconnected with someone who I went through the course with, um, who's now working as a coach. Mm. Um, and we had a Zoom call and caught up on on how life kind of ebbs and flows and slowed us back together so yeah the degree was three years and I sub-majored in psychology and the degree literally I specialized all my kind of specialties were rock climbing and whitewater paddling Mm. throughout the degree which is I suppose great because I ended up meeting my husband rock climbing Um, (laughs) yeah he bike rides and paddles whitewater paddles but Mm. yeah we met rock climbing in terms of outdoor ed, I actually didn't work in that field for very long. Like I said, the degree was really fun. We did heaps of trips. I got to hang out with cool people. I ended up doing my graduate diploma of primary school mm, teaching mm. So, and then did that for a couple of years. I wasn't really into being a teacher either. Yeah. You either know what you're called for or you don't, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So my, like I said, my sub major was psychology and actually at the moment that's what I'm studying. So I'm doing a Bachelor of Psychological Science. 
yeah. part-time at the moment. Mm. Excellent. Well, good luck with that. So did you want to speak more about your son? Like, I'm yes. really looking forward to hearing the episode on Monday. And then also how your family inspires you and how your community inspires mm. you. So my son, Elliot, he's, mm. like I said, he's seven. Yeah. He's turning eight in 22 days. He would like everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, I find it to be interesting because when you, obviously when you speak so highly of your child mm. and, I, and I do, it's really, I suppose, reflecting on the job that we've done raising mm, him. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. They say that, people say that a lot when when they notice babies and babies are very calm, right? And I'm talking mm-hmm. about from say six months to 18 months, mm. which I can honestly say that both my children were quite beautiful at that stage. Um, but I do recall someone coming up to me when my son was six months old and saying to me that he was the most beautiful baby that they've ever seen. Right. And I, I I sort of bewildered by that. I mean, yes, I knew that he was the most beautiful yeah, yeah. child in the world, but for someone to physically come and, and say that to me was just very, very awesome. But then I remember he also said that they are the image of you. Right. Mm. So yeah, I took that as a compliment, of course. Oh, as well. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's how, so, yeah, it's how you interact with them and how, yeah. you know, how they're brought up is, uh, is obviously you know, what brings yeah. out more of the, the beauty and the childlike wonder already in a childlike body. Mm. Mm. So we um, actually, so he was six months old when we built the house that we're in now and we owner built the house. So I was the project manager. Mm. Um, he was crawling around on the dirt, concrete, whatever, in his onesie. And I was quite not distracted, but preoccupied by mm. building a house. I was mm. managing the trades and, um, and my husband was going to work. Yeah, because it's um, big work, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, especially when so you decide to do it on your own. Yeah, yeah. he from very, very early on was quite independent because we, like, we're quite independent people and that's what we, I don't know if we expected of him, but we kind of let him yeah. do his own thing. Mm. And then we moved to this, so he was um, six yeah. months to one-year-old yeah. when he when we built the house. And then we moved to the camp when he was two and a half and he spent most of the next two and a half years talking to anywhere between kind of 14-year-olds and 50-year-olds, mm. 60-year-olds, mm. um, and he could have a conversation with anyone. Like mm. it didn't matter how old they were, who they were. He would tell students who, you know, year nine or ten students, tell them off for being in the wrong places at the camp. He thought he was the boss, you know, <laughs> yes. so he's, he was very confident yeah. but also quite well spoken yeah. as a young person because he was interacting with so many older people. Yes, yeah. It's a bit like being the youngest of siblings and there's like a big age difference, like a 10 or 15 year age difference. You really notice that child's development is a bit more ahead than, you know, your average child. He did have Mm. an interesting time um, moving back here and dealing or spending time with kids his own age, but it didn't take him long to kind of figure out. No, no. But even now I, I find him super compassionate and whether that's to do with, you know, spending so much time with other people that he didn't necessarily know or my diagnosis. Yeah. He's really kind of understanding of other people. He's really open to asking questions. So, you know, we're very open in our family. We talk about a lot Mm. and he's pretty comfortable talking about all those things, anything really. Uh, Yeah, just as a human, I think he's someone I like hanging out with. Yeah, and it's good Um, not to guard them either. It's good not to wrap them in cotton wool and get them to realise that this is life. And I think by showing that at a younger age, they're Mm. not resistant to that when they Absolutely. I think the more you do it early on, Mm. because we've done quite a lot in his little life, but now if we're having those conversations, they're not abstract or, mm, or weird yes. because they're just how we've always Normal. Yeah. About. Yeah. Just, yeah you know we talk about religion we're not religious yeah. we we don't have faith in our family but we talk about religion in terms of Christmas and mm. beliefs and mm. how everyone has different beliefs we talk about disability and you know how there's different levels of that we talk about you know he and my husband have aboriginal background so we talk mm, about yeah, you know, ancestral, history of australia ancestral yeah, yeah. we talk about you know lgbtqia mm. plus rights and community and so they're just conversations that we have in yeah. our home and you know i think it's great like he's he's nearly eight and 
and actually my husband works away a lot so having yeah he's like a know, little buddy right he's, yeah he's and, not and just sure. your son he's a I mean he's buddy. still eight yeah and I'm still his mum and I still get him in trouble and he still doesn't <laughs> like me at times and that's totally fine because I'm not here necessarily to be his friend I'm here to no. be his parent yeah. But we can actually have conversations, you know, every night we sit at the dining table and say, what are you grateful for today? Um, and yesterday we, I took him to swimming and we did it in the car. So he's like, can we do grateful for us now so that when we get home we can watch a movie? And so like, <laughs> so he's, he's like, already doing the negotiations. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I was like, sure, you know, I was tired and, and I, we're sitting in the car together for, you know, half an hour each way. So why not talk about mm. our days now mm. and then mm. sit down and watch Willy Wonka later? Yeah, um, and there's yeah, so many then, versions of Willy Wonka as well. Oh, yeah, so. no, we went to the original one. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, you know, this morning we had a dance party to the songs from the kids' movie Sing too. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's just, there, he's got a lot to him. Yeah, so, yeah. no, that's good. Yes, there's a lot of substance there. And mm. you know what, you, you mentioned something earlier. I know from my learnings, but also probably uh, from a, a personal side as well, that your children can feel you. Right. Mm. And and so I I do this has actually happened with my grandson uh, many years ago, just after my separation. I remember I was on a phone call with a, a friend of mine, um, Chris from Perth, and it was almost as if my grandson knew something was wrong and he mm. immediately came up to me and just gave me a hug. And I will always remember that time, right? Because I was really feeling quite low and um so they feel things that we we probably don't know that they feel more of and that what that is what makes them so um compassionate and kind and yeah uh, from a very yeah from a very young age and not having access to brutality right but in, in saying that of course you're you know not going to to keep them wrapped up Mm. or in your apron for many, many years. But make the most of your son wanting to speak to you now because when <laughs> they get to teenage years, like my son Mason, <laughs> yeah. there's hardly words coming out. But we we do communicate in other ways, like by SMS, right? Like mm. when he's not here, like when he's not physically here, we're probably communicating a lot more. So mm. thank God for, you know, technology mm. as, as such. <laughs> okay, so that's with your son. That's with your son, Elliot. How has your family inspired you? Claire? Yeah, I think it's, you know, there's obviously levels of family. So my husband mm. is an incredible support and yeah. has had a million lives even before we met. Um, oh, and that's, that's a really nice compliment. <laughs> oh, he's, so his career history is he was a mount. No, he was a scuba diving instructor yeah. um, and had got the bends and ended up in a pressure chamber and, died for 90 seconds and then stopped being a scuba diving instructor and became a mountaineer. Mm. So I went from low elevation yeah, to, to high elevation and then did rock climbing, extreme games, climbing. And yeah. so like, and then we met rock climbing um, and has done, you know, amazing things since. And yeah, he's just an amazing support mm. and amazing to have you around. Mm. And just to be able to, you know, the way he cares for his family and looks after us and, you know, life's changed quite significantly yeah. from what he yeah. used Especially to have. from his perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, have you thought yeah. of putting him on the podcast? Because I've actually thought of putting my yeah. husband on the I, podcast. In terms well. of, absolutely, and in mm. terms of talking about um, MS and because obviously that's what I talk about, mm. I actually, he, and he has agreed he's not ready yet. Yeah. So yeah. he hasn't quite got yeah, his. He's not. He's, he's not. There. He's not ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When he's ready, he'll. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. And and the same. You know, I I said to my son. You know, I've been interviewing kind of other people who don't have MS since October, and I've been asking Elliot since then, and he wasn't. He said to me, "Yes, last week." Like he mm. he said, "No, no, 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 no," and then he said, "Yeah, I think I'm ready." Yeah, so um, yeah, I think you he's know, such an old soul. Yeah. So, yeah, having Jay around is amazing, my husband. And then um, my family, the same, you know, the amount of support that my parents give, they thankfully for me live just around the corner and they're incredibly, like, well-connected people yeah, but with also others, mentally, yeah. um, you know, able to kind of organise and plan and, and help out in that really practical sense mm. and are definitely there for, you know, the emotional support when I need yeah. it. So that's amazing. And my, you know, our family's really close and we see each other quite often I'm actually having 
dinner with my brother and sister this Excellent. Friday. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so, you know, it's just really nice to have that kind of family around. Yeah. And have yeah. you learned from your experience of um, being diagnosed with MS, have you learned to be a bit more open with your emotions? Um, with your friends and your family or not still not so I don't I don't think so to be honest Mm. I think I have a really good therapist so I see I talk to her probably once a month and I think I've just found different ways of dealing with and managing Mm. those emotions Mm. journaling a lot talking with other people with MS and honestly I talk about MS so much with so Mm. many you know fasting and yeah it's um, nice to have a bit of a break away from when when you're with your family yeah when I'm with my family we try I try to you know it might come up in conversation but it's not the conversation yeah it's not. and I like it that way yeah Yeah. and okay friends you know they might ask Mm. how's things and you know, I'll tell them, but I'd rather hear about what they've been up to yeah. and I'd rather tell them about my pottery on the weekend or, mm, you know, different yeah. things like that. So it's not that I'm... And it's your coping uh, mechanism. From Well, from yeah, but it's also it. not about not talking about it. It's about not letting it rule my life. Mm, um, mm. So I suppose it's a coping me- mechanism, but it's also a conscious choice of it's almost work now, you mm. know, like I, you need, you know. At the yeah, end but of it's the day, work that you enjoy, right? Oh, absolutely. But yeah. you still need to separate at some point. You need to, like, I, um, there's more to me than multiple sclerosis. Yeah, so oh, I, I understand that. that. You know, yeah. I want to be able to talk about it with all the amazing people that I talk about it with and then with my family and friends I want to be able to because I'm quite which I think it's such an interesting thing to be able to say in these times of social media but I'm actually quite private on social media Mm. so people see a lot of me or see me often but don't see a lot of me yeah Um, no I get that yeah so I like to be able to have that the you know the rest my, my real life my off social media life and off the internet life with my friends and family and sure that includes talking about ms but not as often as i suppose people would assume mm, yeah mm. never never sort of think that though that people will assume i've got to the stage of my life i guess i'm i mean i'm a few years ahead of you claire that there is no delineation between my work practice and my life right there is no such thing as having a balance in your work and your life because my work is my life and my Mm. life and I'm living obviously to work and serve others so for me there is none of that you know there's no line and this is this and this is that all of it is encompassing I'm not sure if that makes sense but yeah no um, it does I just but that's for me obviously which is completely completely different circumstances yeah, yeah. to you and in, in terms of demographic as well as you know I'm completely healthy that I know of touch wood. Yeah, yeah. so I just wanted to mention that and what about your community how has your community inspired you I mean obviously there's the podcast but what else outside of the podcast yeah so I think um you know like what I was just mentioning the the difference between I suppose my in-person friends mm. and community versus the online community um and the online community and the the podcast community has been amazing that's you know it's how I've been able to emotionally support myself through my mm. diagnosis and and initially starting the podcast was completely selfish and the, the do you comments, think oh for sure <laughs> yeah yeah. I, I'm, and I'm super grateful that other yeah, people that you were yeah. yeah but I it's what I wanted and it's and it really helped me with my you know being able with to manage grieving my, yeah well, with, yeah, with your grief, but also yeah, managing my team it. of mm. people who can support me you know before you know I've I've learned a lot about how to manage having MS from the people I speak yeah. to yeah isn't that um, wonderful because yeah. you do I I what I've learned especially with starting uh, the coaching and consulting because I had no idea what type of business I wanted to start. I just knew that I wanted to serve people, right? But what I've learned is that for you to really know a subject, you have to teach it, right? And you've had the background of um, primary school teaching, Mm -hmm. which you knew you you didn't want to do after you had experienced it. But I have learned so much about myself, right, especially sort of in the last yeah. three and a bit years, but probably more so in the last yeah, four to six months or, or maybe perhaps the last one year is mm. when I've really, you know, learned more about me and 
learning more about loving me, right? Or deeply loving myself, which I can, I guess I'm that sort of empath that I can feel when that isn't happening with someone. That's Mm. how, you know, high this, whatever it is, you know, vibration or uh, different Hertz level or, you know, whatever you'd like to call it from a psychedelic um, point of view. But if you have uh, finished talking about the community side, I would like to ask you a question before we uh, keep going. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of love? Oh, my definition of love. Gosh, that's really tricky. I mean, there's so many elements to love, isn't there? Is you know, it's about loving yourself, and like you said, is rediscovering or, or learning about yourself through the work that you do. Um, and I think I really think that having a diagnosis, receiving a chronic illness diagnosis, has forced me to really figure out who I am. Mm. Um, you know, there's no, and I, I did an interview with a woman called Sally Shaw who is a psychologist who has multiple sclerosis and. We spoke about how most people don't actually have to know who they are mm. because you know they get asked the question of oh what do you what, what do you do, do? what do you do you? Yeah. yeah and you, you know I'm a mum or I'm a business owner or I'm all these things but I've really had to kind of pair all of that back because I don't have the luxury of just knowing myself on that kind of surface level mm, so it's, it's and I don't, I don't know that I'm there yet but it's a real kind of self-love that mm. you need to develop redevelop or yeah. develop yeah. after a diagnosis so there's that kind of love of loving yourself which I honestly think and I've said the word selfish in this podcast more times than I care to admit but <laughs> If we're not selfish in our lives, if we're not loving ourselves, we can't possibly be looking after anyone else or Mm, love anyone else. Absolutely true. So I think self-love and love for yourself is incredibly important and maybe even more so after a diagnosis. Mm. Love. I don't know. You you just explained it though. You you just explained it quite eloquently. Oh, did I? There you go. (laughs) You know, but I always just say, just think about, don't think about it too hard. It should just Mm -hmm. sort of come naturally. But I've loved actually asking that to all my podcast guests, right? And and I've learned so much about them just from their responses. So it will make for a wonderful little book, I think, at the end of all this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Once I've done my 70 episodes like you, or or 52 episodes, right? Once I've done that writing a book too <laughs> yes definitely well one of the projects that I have planned is a 365 day quotes book right mm. of my yeah. own but also of you know specific ones that have changed me that have altered mm. my life because purely another guest from a podcast Adrian Duen, he he said something to me that really made me think about changing people's lives on a smaller level right not like on a, a holistic point and he says that every day he sends out a positivity message and it doesn't have to be religious or right or god related it can just be you know good morning have a blessed day or good morning have a joyful day something like that but every single day like how you do the podcast every single monday mm-hmm. Every single day he sends out this positivity message to 100 people. Wow. And I mean, I, yes, I do post probably every single day something of positivity, but I, yeah, I don't do it as intentionally, I don't think, as what he does. And mm. and that really, I, I feel as if that's what I need to be doing, right, to, especially to my private Facebook group um, mm. who I love and adore. And I probably share a lot more in there than I do outside, so there is a bit of a delineation there then, Claire, (laughs) (laughs) between the private Facebook group, which has also started because my dad's name is also private and he passed away almost a year ago today. So, um, but thank you for sharing that. You know, thank you for for your definition of love, which is a question I love, but I'm not sure where I got this from, but I'm just going to read it because I really do think that it's going to resonate with you, Claire. And it is about deeply loving myself. And so the moment that you choose to love yourself with intention, by the grace of your thoughts, words, beliefs, decisions, 
you'll witness your life radically change for the better. And I'm not sure where I got that from, but obviously it was probably from one of the podcasts, many podcasts that I listen to, not just for listening for myself, but obviously I'm listening for training for me Mm -hmm. as well, right? Because anything that I feed myself or anything, um, I mean, your diet is a lot more than the food that you Mm -hmm. place into your body, right? So, but yeah, it's just about staying on top of your game. So you're as optimum as you can be when you do do these podcasts and uh, share your experiences with others, but then Mm. also about listening to others and letting them, you know, share more about themselves. But I really did love your response to, to my last question. So thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to say about, about the diagnosis? No, I think I've really shared the story. Yeah. I just think if anyone's listening who, you know, has a chronic illness, Mm -hmm. um, you know, reach out. I'm always happy to chat. I love a a voice message. You love to chat, which is great. Um, So yeah, feel free to um, find me on Instagram or, um, you know, have a listen to the podcast if it's something that resonates with you. Mm, Yeah, that's, that's lovely. And it's good too, how you said that you don't just interview people with MS anymore. Mm -hmm. You're also dealing with the practitioners now or or the ones that are helping, but probably not even just with MS, right? Like all chronic illnesses. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's great. One of the other questions I wanted to ask you is that how much physical activity can you do? Me, personally? Daily. Yeah, you personally. Um, so I have a goal of doing between 3,000 and 3,500 steps a day. Mm. That's pretty much my maximum. So, And that's light walking? Oh, that's just, that's just Life. incidental. Just, oh, like oh I okay. I, I right, right. Before. So you don't intentionally sort of go out for a half an hour no, no, or no. anything, oh, right? No. That's I just, couldn't, I'd be lucky no. to do 100, 200 meters. Like, there you go. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's what I wanted to, to understand or, or have mm-hmm. the listeners understand. Okay. Yeah. Obviously your diet has changed a lot. Mine as well, hasn't, right? hasn't so much. So um, there's a lot of different MS diets that people try or go on. Um, I just, and I've always eaten pretty healthy. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I'm you know, all about meat and vegetables and I love a cake, you know. Mm, good so, girl. <laughs> so I'm um, pretty. <laughs> Something sweet every now and again, right? Because I, yeah. yeah. Not, not I like time, to but... generally eat things that don't have a list of ingredients on the packet. Mm. You know? I'm actually uh, committed to going without red meat or without eating any red meat or any mm. animal from this coming Saturday. Yeah, right. Fair but I re- until, yeah, I'm going to give myself six months first. <laughs> um, but if it goes beyond that, uh, wonderful to coincide with the no drinking but I do remember listening to a podcast the other day about how having a strict only eating meat diet has helped someone coming out of um, a a big autoimmune deficiency Mm. but it's just incredible what's out there right but as with everything it's what is good for you Absolutely. For your condition and for your body at the time that that happens Mm. but I, I love what you said that you don't want MS to define you. And, and mm. I know, Claire, from, you know, the, from what I do know about you, that you haven't, right? Mm. Every, even from being stoic right from the very beginning and not wanting it to sort of take over, I, I find that very, yeah, that's, that's really, really inspiring. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So on a final note, that, and thank you for sharing so openly as well, Claire, how would you like to leave, you know, what um, is your final message to leave with um, our listeners? I think, you know, we've talked a lot about grief through this mm. episode and I think that people don't have to feel as though they have to follow the kind of grief steps. Um, grief ebbs and flows and, you know, you can go into a deep, you know, dark grief 10 years after any traumatic event. You don't have to kind of get over it. Mm, um, mm. So I think that's something that we don't talk about enough and don't let people grieve. I think particularly, you know, in the Western world is we're not allowed, you know, we just have to move on. So I think it's really important to be to allow ourselves to have those grief moments. Yeah, no, definitely. And, I, and I'm a, a big believer as well that I don't believe that grief never, it never ends. 
Um, I mean, I spoke about my my father before coming up to his one year of his death, mm. but I was saying to uh, my daughter the other day that a couple of weeks, uh, it might have been a bit more than a couple of weeks, but it was the perhaps around the 11th anniversary of his uh, death that for three entire days, for half of those, day, those days, Claire, I kid you not, I was in grief, right? Mm. I don't even think that I um, posted during that time because I just wasn't in that headspace. But I felt as if it was, and this is pertinent, right? Because we were talking about grief. It was pertinent to me because I hadn't allowed myself to go through that space on my own. Yes, I may have grieved with family. I've grieved with my children and friends, but I hadn't taken that time to grieve for dad's loss Mm. on my own. So but I really felt that that happened. I was also introduced to another book because we talked about the five, we probably didn't talk about all the five steps of grief, but I know that there was a book derived from that to say that there is a sixth step. Oh, wow. Right. So I'll, I'll find that. I, I should have had that ready for us, but I'll find it and I'll add it into the, the marketing comments. But thank you, Claire. It's, it's been a really nice conversation and I really do bless you with, you know, much more to come. I just yeah. feel that there's, yeah, there's, there's more out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for having yeah, me. It's been around. an honor to be able to share my story. You're welcome. Come again. You know, once you've reached the, I don't know, 200 and something episodes, yeah. perhaps we can do an episode together. Goodness. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all the best, darling. All right. right. And thank you. I look forward to staying in touch with you as well. All thank right. You. Thanks, darling. Bye. Take care. Thank you Bye. so much. Lots of love. Bye. I'm sure that you would agree that that was a terrific chat with Claire Riley. Uh, she's pretty incredible, you know, where she's intuitively listened to her deep feelings of knowing that being diagnosed with MS was not going to define her. And so I'm really happy that Claire has adapted along with her, her family's help and community uh, and that she's pretty much living proof that she's uh, navigating her way through life on her terms, despite her physical limitations with MS. So go on and kindly follow Claire's great works on Instagram and listen to her MS Understood podcast, which is released early Monday mornings. And you can listen via Spotify or Apple and um, or wherever you listen to your favorite potties. And perhaps as a special gift idea, perhaps you would consider purchasing her Affirm cards for 38 Australian dollars for someone you know who may need some positivity whilst navigating a chronic illness. And this can be done via her Instagram profile, uh, which is in the marketing spiel using Etsy. And so if you've liked this podcast, please comment uh, what your best takeaway is. And I've included Claire's Instagram details in the marketing spiel as well. Thanks and speak again on episode 16. Take care and God bless.